Well, something is always going on. Something is always going on. Also, hello, my friends, and welcome to Ups and Downs from WWE Smackdown, which was a very different show <laughs> from WWE Raw. But we're still going to do the same old thing here. We take the finger of power. There he is. I give him a damn kiss. And if something's good, we point to the skies and we shout up. If something is bad, we point to hell and we say down. It's a very strange concept. Let's up those downs. Here is the deal though. Smackdown did indeed start with Imperium versus the Brawling Brutes. And of course, this was going to be good. It's just how it works. You get born, you go to school, you pay your taxes. These teams have a really good match and then you die. And if you get reincarnated and you still went to see this match, it would rock. The thing is though, given this ended with more teasing that maybe Gunther versus Sheamus are going to do something else. We have to ask the big question about one Drew McIntyre. Because if you do go on that there internet and start reading the rumour mill, some people are saying that he wasn't on Smackdown because he's suffering from a medical issue, so I do hope he's okay, but also that his deal is up at the Tinder 2023, and maybe, just maybe, WWE and Drew are struggling to renegotiate because they're on very different pages. And we do have to take that with a pinch of salt because once again it is pro wrestling, but if you were wondering, where the hell is Drew McIntyre? Well, now you know. And honestly, please wrestling, would you just take a day off? There's too much news. Anyway, Butch and Giovanni Vinci started this thing out as he called to his Bowser brother Ludwig Kaiser when they started to book the boots to Ridge Holland and the whole time Seamus was like, tag me, tag me. That's not how Seamus talks. I'm not very good at accents. Gunther was also casting distraction the whole time, including grabbing the Irishman and being like, ha ha, I will not let you tag in. Until eventually Seamus did get the hot tag and he went absolutely crazy. He also went right after the Intercontinental Champion and he was going to bro kick him when Gunther was like, no, and he German suplexed his ass. Es war nix sein Arsch. The tag klaxon ha then sounded, so we just got big move after big move after big move. When Seamus saw Vinci and said to himself, well, I'm pretty sure that's the guy that always gets beat, he slammed him with the bro kick, he pinned him for the one, two, three, and then afterwards, Shane was looking at Gunther, and Gunther was looking at Shane, so maybe, just maybe at some point, Seamus will win the IC Championship. We have to wait and see. This was just so much fun, though, and of course, we got a little bit of big men slapping man meat, so we could do this for the rest of the year, as far as I'm concerned. Give it an up. We then got a recap video about Brock Lesnar turning on Cody Rhodes on Raw when Wade Barrett and Michael Cole started to tease the reason as to why. Because Wade was all like, well, I heard that Brock didn't appreciate being on WrestleMania in match number one, so we took it out on Cody Rhodes. And I was like, man, please let this be true. This is the dumbest reason for getting mad at somebody ever. I mean, what is Brock Lesnar? Eight years old? Also, why isn't he mad at the Usos, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn? As far as I recall, they had the main event too. But then cut to Kayla Braxton, who was talking to Paul Heyman and Sola Sokoa as we learned that no, Roman Reigns is not on the show tonight. And seriously, if only I could avoid my job as much as the head of the table. Which is not true, I enjoy my job, just waving my finger around. We also kind of teased that maybe, just maybe, Heyman had something to do with what Brock Lesnar had done when we started talking about the fact that Roman Reigns is headed to 1,000 days as champion. And that is definitely going to happen now. I mean, that's why we did at WrestleMania what we did. Jey Uso then walked in like some kind of mum who had lost their son at a department store because he was all like, Paul, have you seen Jimmy Uso, my brother? Because apparently I didn't bother to call him up, so I have no idea where he is. When Heyman was all like, yeah, I chatted to Roman Reigns, who also chatted to Jimbo, and we told him to stay home tonight because he wants to watch you beat Sami Zayn live on television. So we were right back into the Bloodline stuff, and I was so appreciative of this, because after all, I went, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why didn't Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn care about the Usos or anybody else anymore? Because even though they had become the tag team champions, that wasn't the goal. The goal was to end the Bloodline, and here they were on Monday just doing a dance of joy. The absolute best bit, though, is Paul Heyman then went pure mob boss, because as soon as Jey Uso had left, he turned to Solo and he said, look, either Jey Uso is going to sort out Sami Zayn or we have a bigger problem on our hands and you're going to have to sort that one out. Ruh -roh. This segment wasn't even that long, but it was so damn packed with layers. It was like eating an onion, which you should not do without cooking it first. Give it a nub. Then it was Ricochet versus Ivar. 
Why not? Now, this was off the back of the WrestleMania Showcase match, which may have been the surprise of the weekend. It was so damn fun. And Adam Pearce had finally decided to do his job because Braun, Raw, Strowman and Eric were banned from ringside. However, Valhalla was still there. So I wanted to ring up ads and go, Matt, have you not been watching the shows? She's the problem. She keeps interfering. I also kind of feel like Eric needs a last name because when they were talking about him on commentary, it just sounded like some dude from accounts. And given that they only had four minutes here, they just went crazy quick. Ricochet did some flippy dippy moves. Ivar would grab him and kind of slam him around for a while until Ricochet hit that shooting star press. And he got the one, two, three. Now I have no idea where these guys are headed, but at least they gave me some entertainment is all I need in my life. Give it up. And then, thank goodness, because once again, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn were focusing on the bloodline. Because Kevin Owens was super pumped for Sam, was like, oh man, you can finally take out Jey Uso for good. Whereas Zayn had a different tact. He was like, nah, I can feel deep down in my tum-tum that maybe somebody needs to talk to Jay because he's still conflicted, so that's going to be me. And KO was like, don't do that. It's not going to work out. So this was essentially Star Wars. Owen has known Sam for a long time, though, and knows that he's not going to be able to talk him out of this, so Zayn did go and do this. Once again, I just like what we're doing here. We have fallen right back into it, and given that Cody Rhodes didn't win at WrestleMania, meaning you do have to continue forward... This was probably the way to do it. Up. And then we continued everything between Raquel Rodriguez and Liv Morgan. And I tell you this, it is so obvious, at least to me, that eventually Raquel will turn on Liv. Because I'm a bad man, I was like, yeah, do it, you better do it. This was nothing though. I mean, they were fighting Natalia and Shotzi, which was kind of surprising because Natalia likes to change her tag team partners more than she likes to change her clothes. And they cut the funniest promo ever before this when Nat was like, yeah, we thought about it. And me and Shots have decided we should be the number one contenders. I was like, why? You never win. It only went around about two minutes as well when Liv Morgan was able to hit the DDT and the Oblivion onto Shotzi. And she got the one, two, three. I was like, good for you. Now, if they didn't have this upcoming tag team title match on Raw, this would be bizarre. But the whole point is, they do have the tag title match. It's like the people crazy on the internet that go, this Batman game wouldn't be as good if Batman wasn't in it. The Dark Knight is right there, damn it, why are you ignoring him? Therefore, I shall give it an up and look. I kind of feel like Raquel Rodriguez is also going to win money in the bank. And that's what we should be doing post-WrestleMania, making damn superstars. So yeah, like Captain Picard, make it so. And then Emma was watching Xavier Woods and Matt Cat Moss play WWE 2K23. I had to grab my head to make sure I was still alive. This was so damn random. It was great, though, because LA Knight then walked in, and if you listened, the crowd went absolutely crazy. And he was basically like, man, video games. What a waste of time, you absolute geek and nerds. So I was offended. I like video games. He was also upset that he never got his WrestleMania moment, and that may have been planned until somebody, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, went and cut it. And obviously Xavier was like, look, man, why are you coming in here and insulting this form of entertainment? In fact, everybody is sick of you. Why don't we have a match next week? So this is basically like Japanese shampoo commercials, but look, it is wrestling, and you can make a story out of everything. And I also want to point out the other reason LA Knight had tears in his eyes is because he wasn't on WrestleMania, but Bad Bunny and Snoop Dogg were. I was like, that's a good point. When it comes to these celebrities, why is everybody named after an animal? At least it does mean that Knight will be back on TV soon, which is the same for Xavier Woods. I love both these guys. When we cut back to the arena and we heard, Behold the king, the king of kings. Out came Triple H. Now, once again, he had a big old rah-rah speech about WrestleMania, and he was like, we made so much money. Thank you very much. But that's the past, and we're living in the presence, so now it's time to look to the future, because in a few weeks, we're going to do a WWE draft. And I was like, oh, man, amazing. Think about seeing the likes of Rhea Ripley on Raw or Sola Sakura on SmackDown. And I realized, wait a minute, that's what we're getting right now anyway. So I did groan a little bit because I don't think we need this. And it's much more fun when a WWE superstar can just turn up on Mondays or Fridays as and when needed. But the game did kind of sell this as a big deal. And I trust in Paul Levesque. He hasn't steered me wrong so far. So I shall give this an up. But I am retroactively ready to take it away. And imagine he hears about that sure he'd be absolutely devastated. The highlight of all of this, though, is that when he was done, Triple H also said, oh, let me introduce Rhea Ripley. So we are putting her over. And that's somebody else that should be pushed in 2023. And it meant the Judgment Day came out together. 
And I ask you this, dear watcher, who better than the Judgment Day? And the answer is nobody. Sorry, Mum, I have spoken. It started with Ripley, who reminded us that she had defeated Charlotte Flair at WrestleMania, and because of that, everybody should now stand up for Mammy. Now, clearly someone in the back had told her, you need to get really aggressive about this. But as soon as the words came out of her mouth, all the fans stood up anyway, because people love Rhea Ripley. And look, even though I was watching it at home, I stood up too. I mean, I looked really weird, but sometimes I just like to get involved. Finn Balor then took over and mentioned the 14 stitches he had put in his head because Edge had thrown a ladder at him. And sure, whatever, the rated R superstar may have won, but do we see him now? No. Whereas Finn is right here? I was like, yeah, that's true. Also, I've been thinking about this. Why did Edge win that match? We should have given it to Balor. Dominic then grabbed the microphone. <laughs> At this place, totally lost it. I mean, he gets such good we hate you heat. Somebody needs to give him some kind of a medal. And he also had the best reason why he lost at WrestleMania. It's because he was fighting his dad. So he didn't go in 100%. He didn't even want to throw a punch. So as always, I'm just giving him a round of applause. And if I ever get to meet Dominic Mysterio, with his permission gonna give him a hug. He also mentioned Bad Bunny, which is when Damien Priest took over and was all like, <laughs> sorry I threw you through a table, Bad Bunny. So you can see what we're going to do here. We're gonna get to Backlash and we shall do that big tag team match. And I tell you this, the Judgment Day should win that. And also we should get back to Ray versus Dom and the Condom needs to get a visual pinfall over his father. Until that does happen, I'm going to stand here with my arms crossed, which is not true. Eventually, YouTube will run out of time. Ray and the LWO then did make their way to the ring because we were going to do Ray Mysterio and Santos Escobar taking on Dominic and Damian Priest. And absolutely fantastically, not only did Dom and Damo win, but they did so with the help of Rhea Ripley. <laughs> so I was just having the best time. Ray and Santos also did a simultaneous dive at one point because I'm sure they talked to each other and said, what does everybody do in 2023 wrestling? That's right, we just do the flippy dippy doo dah stuff. But when he was going for the 619, Rhea Ripley was like, no, she went and cast distraction which is when Zelina Vega went and took out the brand new Women's Smackdown champion. This was great too, because Rhea was like, ha, ha, you shouldn't have done that. And she chased Vega out the building. Now I'm sure we will do some TV matches before then, which is more than fine, because Rhea can get some wins. Went from nowhere, Damian Priest blind tagged in, Santos had no idea, he got hit with that big old choke slam, one, two, three. And I like this a lot, because Damian wasn't able to do anything on WrestleMania, and it also technically counts as a Dominic Mysterio win. So I know these dudes are meant to be the ultimate bad guys, but I like every single one of them. And the sheer effort they've put in over the last 12 months, they have completely turned the ship around, and I am giving all this an up. The story continues, and it should continue for a long ass time. Sami Zayn then did find Jey Uso, and man, did he do a number on him. Six. Because he went into all this shtick about how Roman Reigns hates him and the Budline doesn't want him. And unless he starts to stand up for himself soon, he is going to get manipulated into the ground. Which is kind of true, Jay. What you need to do is go home and watch SmackDown and you will hear all the terrible things that Paul Heyman is saying about you. From nowhere though, we then heard this massive noise and it turned out that Sola Sokoa had attacked Kevin Owens. And he had taken one of those flight cases or a box-like structure and he had basically shattered KO's ankle. So Sam was like, okay, I guess I was wrong. The bloodline are actually more powerful than ever. And of course tied into our main event because Sam was like, oh, I guess Kev can't accompany me to the ring. Although we probably shouldn't have been doing that anyway because they're meant to be good guys. But we had Sami Zayn versus Jey Uso. And I was kind of surprised we just did this on free TV. I mean, you absolutely could have saved it for a pay-per-view. <laughs> Excuse me, premium live event. So does the Dakota also walk to the ring after a little while. And I was like, where the hell have you been? I presume he must have been on the toilet. And even though Zayn was a rockin' and a rolling here, once again, what's the point? He didn't have his friend. He didn't have Kevin Owens and the bloodline of getting back to the top of the chain. So they beat him. I mean, they whooped his ass. I mean, the finish was a bit of an eye roll because once again, we did that thing when Zayn was on the outside. The referee wasn't looking, so Sola Sokoa stuck him with the Samoan spike when Jey Uso just booted him right in the face and he got the one, two, three. And this is when they started to put the boots to Zayn. But at one point when Sola was going to spike him again, Jey Uso had a crisis of confidence. He was like, no, no, we can't do this. I don't know what to do anymore. Until he changed his mind 
and he super kicked Sam right in the face. He also told Sokoa to get a chair, so somebody was going to have to come out to make the save. And surprisingly, but not actually that surprisingly when you think about it, it was Matt Riddle who at this point still has his first name. Now he did march to the ring, and again, do not forget, why was he away for so long? Because the bloodline tried to kill him. So of course he would come back to try and get his revenge. So unlike two plus two equals potato, this is actually two plus two equal in four. It also means that we can do Zayn, Owens and Riddle taking on the Usos and Solar Sokoa for a while on pay-per-view, sorry, premium live event. And all of that is okay. I mean, I kind of think we do need Roman Reigns on the show right now, but I shall let it play out. Those famous words, giving it up. Which did indeed bring us to the end of SmackDown. And yes, compared to Raw, this was far much better because we just keep the narrative going. It's like any kind of TV show. If you tell me a story, I just want to get to the conclusion. I had a good time. Up. Now, please do leave a comment below and let me know what you thought about last night's episode of SmackDown and click one of the videos on the screen. I'm sure one of them could be a WrestleMania ups and downs, and that delights as many people as it does annoy. My name is Simon for What Culture. Thank you once again for an absolutely tremendous WrestleMania week. I love each and every single one of you, and I'm going to take you out on a dinner date. You take care of yourselves. See you soon.